Hey everybody, welcome to episode 22 of the Go Get Outside podcast. This is your host, Jason Milligan. It's celebration time here at the podcast. We have made it all the way to episode 22 and completed the entire first season. But do not worry, this is not the last episode of the show. It's just the last episode of this season. There will be a second season, and I'll talk about that more after the interview. On today's show, Tommy Day, Dr. Tommy Day. He is a super cool dude with a super nice wife who both let me sleep on their couch for a couple of nights while I was up there in Portland, Oregon. Tommy agreed to come into some wet, cold, amazing canyons up there in Oregon and Washington with me and some other canyoneers and shoot some video. Not only is Mr. Dr. Tommy Day a physician, a father, a husband, But he's also an outdoorsman who's big into cycling, anything on two wheels he's into, fly fishing, he's a photographer, and he is now a filmmaker. So after three days of running canyons in the area, he and I got together on his roof patio shortly before I got back on the road to continue on with my road trip, and we recorded this interview. So let's go listen to Tommy Day talk about cycling, fly fishing, photography, and making that career transition from physician to filmmaker. Tommy Day, end of season one, starting now. Tommy Day, 42 years old, raised in the southeast, adopted to the Pacific Northwest, trained as a physician, but have recently mutinied and started my own film and photography business based in Portland, Oregon, focused on wilderness, outdoor adventure, things like that. I've spent the last year and a half going down that road full force, and it's been awesome. So I know that you are a fly fisherman, correct? Yes. And then you're also a bit of a mountaineer, hiker. Yes. What other activities? Are you just kind of a generalist and you like to try everything? I've done a little bit of everything over the years. I would say the things that I keep coming back to are fly fishing and anything cycling. I love cycling. I love the the notion of bicycles. The more I think about it, I think that's one of the reasons I like fly fishing too, because they're both so simple. And, and when you break it down, there's a lot of gear and expensive stuff associated with it if you want it to be, but you can also make it incredibly simple. The basic function of a bicycle hasn't changed since it was invented. And to me, that's genius because there's still millions of people around the world that get around on a bicycle every day. So I'm forever fascinated by bicycles and there's something about fly fishing that is therapeutic and spiritual and amazing on so many different levels. The fish, you know, when you see a trout, when you hold a, a trout in your hand, it's just, it's as close to nature as I think you can get. So. so I think maybe what you need to do is figure out a way to combine cycling and fly fishing into a hybrid sport. I know, I know. You I, fish from a bridge as you whiz by. Yeah, <laughs> I actually have considered doing, you know, a cycling trip where I take some of my gear and just ride from river to river and that kind of thing and there's some rivers in Oregon actually where you can ride along they have like a rails to trails trail where you can ride you know for miles along the Deschutes River which would be pretty cool yeah so then surfing is another big thing for me I love the ocean I love the salt water I think marine life is so dynamic and the ocean for me is a very invigorating and renewing place I love being at the beach those are the salient themes I would say in my life and I know you recently tried kiteboarding right I did I had a hurried tutorial from a buddy of mine who's pretty much an expert kind of got hooked I mean I didn't do the whole experience but when that kite dragged me into the air it was it was pretty magical you told me it was the closest sensation you've ever had to flying it was intrigues me a lot yeah Yeah, it was. When the kite first dragged me out of the water into the air, it really was like I felt like I was flying. You know, I've done bungee jumping, and I've done parasailing and paragliding, I guess. I've done both of those. This was definitely the closest I've ever felt to feeling like I was taking flight. 
So you're gonna you're gonna pursue it some more if I can find the time and money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have a newborn baby to contend with at the same time. I do. Yeah. So let's rewind you way back in time. How did you first start getting involved in these outdoor activities? Did it start at childhood? Did it come later in life? Do you not remember? You know. My parents, when they were still married, did camping. So that's really the only thing I can think of. Like, it wasn't like my parents were... My dad actually was an adrenaline junkie, I guess. He was he was a certified jump master when he was in the military, and he loved to ride motorcycles. So he likes motorized bicycles, and you like yeah. human-powered bicycles. I guess on some level, maybe. And then when he, my parents got divorced, he bought a farm, and I was always outside. I mean, that's what I did during my summers was just, I work. it was work, but I was always outside. And then as I got into junior high and high school, I just always wanted to be in the mountains. Really, the mountains were what just always called me. I liked going to the beach also. Like I said before, I've always loved the ocean. But something about growing up in the southeast where you don't really get to see those massive peaks. The first time I went to Colorado and saw the Rockies, I, I was in love. It just grabbed me. I know what you mean because I grew up in Louisiana where there are very few high points. The entire state is almost entirely flat and so it wasn't until I was much older that I started to see mountains and then I moved to California and I'm surrounded by mountains. I feel like there, when you look at mountains, besides the fact that they're just beautiful and mind-blowing, there's like this sense of kinetic energy because of the shapes of them. Makes me want to do things more than a flat landscape does. I, I agree with you. I think when I look at a mountainscape I see potential. I see possibility. I, I see it as potential energy. I lived in Montana for three years and had a view out my window of, you know, the Rocky Mountains. Even though I was there for three years and looked at the same thing every day, it was always different. I always looked at a different little kernel or a different knob or something like that and thought, oh, I could climb that or I could ski that or I could ride that or whatever. You know, I just, I wanted to be in it. And that has always resonated with me very deeply and I think I went to college on the east coast and then after college I started doing research and stuff related to med school all my buddies were going out west to do like spring break or summer trips or summer work or whatever and I just always denied myself that opportunity because I thought education should be number one finally for grad school I went to Montana State in Bozeman and just had the best three years it's amazing really that I'd finished the schooling if I didn't have med school as a goal beyond that I probably would have still be in Bozeman right now because I just loved it that much that's where I learned to fly fish that's when I learned to kayak that's when I got heavy into rock climbing I had a season pass for snowboarding so it was on the mountain like three times a week it was just insane sounds like a lot of it came in grad school that's where it really cemented yeah then I moved back to the east coast for med school residency fellowship all the while thinking, how am I going to get back out west? And so as soon as I finished my training and the opportunity presented itself, we, my wife and I took a job in Portland, and the rest is history. And you've been here two years now, you said, right? Full time. Yeah, we've been coming and going since 2009. Oh, okay, so quite yeah, a while. Yeah, almost six years now, which is crazy. We came for three months the first time and, and immediately signed on for another three and then spent time thereafter getting back here as often as possible. And eventually, just we're like we got, we just gotta move there. Tell me a little something because fly fishing is something that I know almost nothing about. Imagine you're talking to an idiot like me, <laughs> and you need to, you need to tell That's not me hard a little. To do. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Shouldn't be hard to imagine this. Tell me what I need to know about fly fishing. I wouldn't tell you what you need to know. I will share with you why I think it's different and why I think it's special. Usually, I start off by comparing it to what they call gear fishing, which is where you use a spin rod with lures that have like multiple hooks on them or you might use live bait and that is a game of numbers typically so you're casting over and over and over and you're and you're using these lures or bait that are overly enticing to the fish it's like they can't resist it you know it'd be like putting raw meat in front of a dog they're gonna bite it nine times out of ten then you just yank you're using heavy tackle so the rod is really intense and when you reel the fish in it's like you don't feel the fight as much it's not about the process it's about getting the fish on board and sometimes they'll keep them and sometimes they'll throw them back fly fishing on the other hand you have to thread your own line you assemble your rod you thread your line then you have to put on a what's called a tippet which is a you know kind of an intermediary piece of line then you put on or sorry a leader then a tippet and then on the tippet you finally tie a fly and so you hand tie the fly on there yourself your use of the fly is contingent on The water level, the location, the weather, the time of day. So throughout the day, there are different hatches of insects that happen. And you're trying to match, oftentimes, 
your fly to what you think the fish might want to eat. And that changes throughout the day. It's a variable. It's a variable. <laughs> so then you go about casting. And learning to cast a fly rod is a bit of an art. Once you're doing that, though, you're back casting and the line goes back, let's say, 20, 15, 20 feet. You forward cast and it comes out really smoothly, smoothly and lands on the water. And then you're waiting. And, and you could do that for hours and never catch a fish. For a lot of people, that's maddening. It's like, why would I ever do that? You know, that sounds like a waste of my time. If it resonates with you, it, it's completely spiritual because you're in the water. That's the other thing that I think is really cool about fly fishing is that nine times out of ten you're wearing waders and you're, you're waist deep or maybe even deeper in water. So the water is flowing by you. You get that kind of serenity associated with moving water. And you can touch it, right? You can If you're in a boat fishing, you, you don't usually touch the water. But when you're there in it, you're like, you know, you could touch it and put it on your face or whatever. And then you change flies. If it's not working, you change flies. But the first time that a, a trout, I typically fly fish for trout. You can saltwater fish for other things, which is also awesome. But the first time a trout hits the end of your line and, and, and it's on there, it's so magical because the rod, it's such light tackle. It's so delicate and sensitive that the rod picks up even the slightest vibration. And so if you have a fish that is two pounds, that's a big trout really you know it's a fair sized trout because on a rod like that you're getting a lot of play and all of a sudden it hits it the line runs out the reel starts to spin and it has this musical quality to it and then it's the art of trying to fight that fish to bring it to hand almost all trout fishermen catch and release so you bring the fish to hand and you come so intimately close with this creature that's gorgeous and then you set it free and that's another thing that people who don't fly fish, they, don't, they can't get it. They're like, why would I work all day to bring something to hand and then, and then let it go? There's just something really magical and spiritual about it to me, uh, to get that close to a creature that you've stalked all day at times, and then to say, you know what, this was awesome, but I'm going to let you go back out into the world. Uh, Do you ever keep your catch and um, cook it? There are times, yeah. There's a place we camp here in Oregon where it's a lake, so it's not a stream. The fish are kind of keen to bite there, and so, but they're smaller. Well, what we'll do is we'll camp there, we'll catch a hand, you know, maybe three or four, and cook them on, over the fire that night. You know, it's not like it's going to waste. And it's delicious. You know, it's great. Yeah, uh, I think you have to experience it to kind of know it, to know that feeling. And I can see how some people are like, dude, that sounds like really boring. To me, also, the, the, the essence of when you get into a really intense cast, you could have 30, 40 feet, maybe more of line out which is a lot to manage, especially if there's any wind. But it's so poetic, especially when you, if you're, you know, you're, I, I tend to just get wrapped up in watching my own line, which you're not supposed to do, but I'll watch my buddies fish, and I just love to watch the line go back and forth. I have hundreds of photos of their line in midair because it's just, it's so artistic to me. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen video of fly fishing, and it is interesting watching that line. It almost kind of looks like it defies physics the way it moves through the air. It's like a snake. Yeah. It snakes through the air. Yeah. And if you do it properly, it's it's a real beautiful thing to watch. I'm I'm I would consider myself a beginner to a, you know, advanced beginner even though I've been doing it for a number of years, but some of the guys I fish with are they're real craftsmen and it's it's a special thing. I don't know. I I feel like I haven't done it a real service, but I would highly encourage you to go with someone that knows what they're doing because they can manage, you know, you're going to inevitably get your line tangled a bunch when you first start and that's frustrating. I would encourage you to go with someone who will take care of all that for you the first time and put you on a fish and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Because my experience with fishing, mostly when I was younger, and it was always kind of that traditional fishing where you just got reel, you sit on a dock, right. or you sit on a boat, and you drop it in, and you wait for that little red and white. Yeah, uh, bobber. Yeah, a little bobber to bob up and down, and then you reel it in, and maybe you have a fish, but you probably don't. Yeah. And then you do it again. Right. And, oh, and occasionally maybe you stare into a cardboard box full of hundreds of crickets and get creeped out. That's been my experiences with fishing. Yeah. Well, I would, I would compare it for you for canyoneering. If you went to a canyon where there was roadside access, basically got out of your car and got in, and it was a bunch of like eight-foot waterfalls, and there were a bunch of other people around, you would be like, eh, eh. But if you had to hike in for an hour, then you had to, you know, let's just say it was some massive rappel, and then the view was just incredible. Like, that work that you did, you'd be like, holy shit, it was it was intense, but it, look at what we ended up with. To me, that's kind of the analogy for fly fishing, is that it's a lot more work, almost as a rule. And it sounds like that labor is kind of part of the draw. It is. Like, it's, 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 you earn 
the moment. Yeah, totally. And t- it's it's a process, right? You have to love the process. And for some people, they just can't stand it. There's a fervent following. Those who are into it, kind of like with canyoneering. I mean, those people who are into it are like into it. Oh yeah, you met a bunch of them this week. I did. Yeah. I mean, they're. I was thinking about it. It's like adult fun. Like canyoneering is basically like being a kid. You know, it's like as close as you can get to being a kid and still be an adult. Frolicking in the water and you're yelling out loud and you're jumping off rocks and stuff. You're occasionally urinating on yourself because you're wearing a wetsuit. <laughs> right. <laughs> that happens. I like being a kid. That happens too. <laughs> anyway, fly fishing is a something I plan to stay involved in. It's a lifetime sport too, which is really nice. And You were mentioning yesterday, we talked about cycling a little bit. And uh, you've competed in some races or things like that, right? Tell me a little bit about those. Well, I started doing triathlons when I, I got divorced, or right before I got divorced, actually. I kind of was working my way up, just doing little what they call sprint triathlons, and I, and I started riding a bike for that. I hadn't been riding a bike prior to that. I, I grew up riding a bike as a kid, like lots of kids do, and, and I always loved mountain biking. When I was in college, I had this really crappy mountain bike, and we would go on the only trails available to us. And then anytime I went out west, I would I would rent a mountain bike and go mountain biking. And I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. As my life got more complex and I got more involved in advanced study, I just, it, it fell away. I started in triathlons. I got back into the cycling. And then I kind of started getting into racing bikes independent of triathlon. And then we went and lived in New Zealand for six months, and the Kiwis are crazy about cycling. They love it. So you probably could have just said the Kiwis are crazy and yeah, ended it right. They're there. crazy about everything. I mean, these they're they're amazing people. And so we lived in this really small town, farming community, that had a, a really intense cycling scene. It was crazy. So I got involved in the club there and started racing competitively. Then when I came back to the states, I signed up for an Ironman triathlon, which is pretty much the longest distance i mean they do they do double ironmans and some stupid stuff like that but in general when you look at the food chain of of triathlon that's kind of at the top and so then i was doing 100 plus mile bike rides on a consistent basis and and then i also got into cycle cross which is a huge pacific northwest thing it's it's a culture here a subculture so yeah i've kind of i've done most versions of cycling in one capacity or another. I've never raced a mountain bike. I'd like to do that at some point. Do you have a preference? Road biking call to you more? Mountain biking call to you more? I think in general, mountain biking does. Each f- version of cycling has its pluses, I think. Triathlon is is just a full tilt solo endeavor, so it's just you against the clock, which is kind of cool. And you have the gear for triathlon is like the best, right? Because you've got those bikes that are so aerodynamic with the crazy rims and when you're on a triathlon bike and you are hauling ass, you feel like a total stud. Um, <laughs> until until you look in the mirror and see how you're dressed. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then mountain biking to me is just like kind of like canyoneering. It's like being a kid. You know, it's super fun. You get to jump and get in the dirt and do crazy stuff. Road racing is hyper competitive and dangerous, but thrilling for that reason. You get to work as a team at times, which is really neat. And you get to go really fast in tight quarters. There's that thrill of competition that's very palpable, which I which I really like. Cyclocross here is kind of a nice hybrid of all those things, because it's full throttle. Like it's basically red line from the second the gun goes off until the second you finish, and it's usually about 45 minutes. Which doesn't sound that long to a layperson, but if you're in a cyclocross race, if you're doing anything like that for 45 minutes, it's like basically you're ready to throw up the whole time. I mean, I couldn't sprint for 45 minutes. Right. It is like sprinting on a bike for 45 minutes. Right. And you're having to get off your bike, put it on your shoulder, jump over obstacles, go through creeks or what have you. And you're shoulder to shoulder with people at times. But the subculture for cyclocross is super chill. It's like beer drinking, music, good food. And it's always done in the fall, which is crappy weather. So you have to really like it to be out there. So, again, like canyoneering, the subculture is, is very devoted and, and keen. And so if you get into that, it's it can be really a lot of fun. So that's one thing I think I'd like to get back into is, is the cyclocross, just because it's so available to me. It's seasonal. It only lasts for six to eight weeks. Oh, that is a very short season. Yeah. It's usually like, well, they're they're expanding it because it's so popular now. It used to be like beginning of October to, the, to like mid-November, maybe the end of November. But now it's starting like September through. They're doing these like winter races now and stuff. So 
But you have to, if you want to compete in cyclocross, you have to train. Like you can't just show up. Maybe there's an occasional freak athlete who can just show up and do it, but because it's so anaerobic and so intense, you really have to train to do it. And so that requires advanced preparation, which sometimes, you know, I'm just too busy doing other things that I like to do to, to prepare. It's kind of hard to balance when you like like 50 different things and you're also a professional and you have children. It's probably yeah. pretty hard to balance all that stuff at yeah. times. Well, I'm a Gemini too, Jason. So I, I've been told that astrologically it means I, I like to have it both ways. You know, I like, uh, I like to have my cake and eat it too. I like lots of different things. So in the very scientific realm of astrology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a convenient excuse. That's what I usually look for when I go to a, when I go to a physician. I hope they check my astrological chart and give me some advice based on that. Yep. So let's switch gears a little bit. We'll mention why why I'm here at your house, far north in Oregon, far away from my own house. You and I met last year, in November, at a, in a filmmaking workshop in Banff. Mm-hmm. You are trying to transition into a filmmaker. What made you decide to do that? Film and photography is something that I've always wanted to do, I've always been passionate about and have done as a hobby. I've always taken pictures and then once video became more available to the consumer, I, I started doing home videos of my buddies and my family and everything, doing snowboarding or what have you. And I think the more I've been in it, the more I realize it takes me places that I love to be and that's outside. And it puts me around people that are like-minded and that that I enjoy spending time with. It's very rare that you get involved with people that are in outdoor stuff and you don't have a good time. Right. And that you, and there are people you can't get along with. That's very rare. Right. At least in my experience. I think, I think in general terms that that's very true. Every now and then, you you know, you've got the the 5% on either end of any spectrum that you you may not get along with, but yeah. So I was at a stage in my medical career where work conditions were getting more and more difficult from an administrative standpoint. It just, I wasn't practicing medicine. I was managing humans and not that weren't patients. I was managing the business aspect of it. And they were asking more and more of the physicians in in less time. There was no autonomy. And I felt that the essence of medicine had been sucked out of the practice. And, and it was killing my soul. Honestly, I was dealing with these bureaucrats that, that just crushing my soul and I started having really I started having to be perfectly honest health problems like I, my blood pressure was going up I was getting headaches and I was just completely stressed out at the same time I had been kind of leaning more towards the photography and film I'd kind of been doing I'd gotten a bigger better camera and started investing more time in that so eventually my wife was like you should you should quit you know it's killing you and once she said that it just like it was like a switch was flipped you know all of a sudden the pressure I I guess I didn't know I had put that kind of pressure on myself but I think I had I still worked full time after that for almost I don't know maybe 10 months but no no I'm sorry it's like six months later I, I quit working full time but it allowed me to open the door to a new direction and once I did it was just like weight lifted let's let's get this done I'd always I'd always heard of the Banff Film Festival and had gone to it on a number of occasions and to me it represented kind of the pinnacle of the adventure world. I applied to the filmmaking workshop and was accepted. I had no idea what to expect when I got there. I, I presumed I would be the least experienced person, which was pretty much true. I think there were a couple I other ones. I don't think that was true. You know, there were a few other people there that that were not that experienced, but but it was just such a. I mean, you were there. It was such an. For me, it was a total game changer. I mean, absolute game changer it blew my mind in so many ways and it just it proved to me that I was going to do this this was going to happen and it really sealed the deal for me as far as moving forward on on what was a possibility because I was walking away from a guaranteed paycheck right retirement spent many many years many years investing in and and so it wasn't without it took me a long time to come to that decision and even once I made it I was like I would have I mean, I would just have absolute freak out moments where I was like, what in the hell am I doing? (laughs) You know, like this is crazy. And I remember when I mentioned it to my mom, I was expecting her to say, oh, no, you don't. (laughs) You forget about that, mister. Um, Stop having your midlife crisis. Yeah, exactly. What are you, 40? Oh, come on. (laughs) It's too cliche. Yeah. But she should just buy a fancy car. Right. Yeah. (laughs) But she supported me fully. She's like, I think you should do it. Again, that was one of those little another brick in the wall that kind of got things going and 
we we've, we've talked about this over the last few days that I I feel like once you put your mind to something, that the universe kind of conspires and puts things in your path that that facilitate your your growth and your progress. You kind of don't know what allies you have until you start to seek them. Right. And you start to realize, oh, wow, I didn't realize I had this whole network of people available to me. Yeah. So that was the that was the build up to Banff. And Banff was just like a powder keg, right? Just exploded for me. And ever since then, I've been really aggressive in pursuing my passion, my new passion. I mean, I, I would I would say it's been a passion of mine forever, but now I call it my my new profession. Yeah, and I'm up here, and you're letting me stay in your house very graciously no. because I convinced you that you should come along with me into these raging, wet, slippery canyons yep. with people you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Repel down waterfalls and jump off things and swim all day long and lug some cameras around and shoot some video while you're at it. How was that for you? It was awesome. It was totally awesome. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have to convince me. I, as soon as you mentioned it, I was like, I'm totally on board. I also didn't have to tell you a story about a person that died doing it. Right. I probably should have known better than yeah. to do that. Well, at least you waited till day two to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't know exactly what to expect. I'd been canyoneering once before, like 20 years ago, right after college. And I loved it. And I've always loved climbing, and I've always loved water. So I thought, hey. And I, and I wanted to film. I thought this would be a great opportunity. So... It didn't take any convincing for me, but I definitely wasn't sure exactly what to expect. You know, when it's your first time filming canyoneering, it's it's a different experience than if it had been my first time, you know, canyoneering. Right. Absolutely. So I had a lot going on in my mind and and also in my body. You know, it was a lot of work, but it was it was an incredible experience. So I'd... one of the great things is we were both going into it meeting with people we didn't personally know who I know about through other people and who were recommended to me. And we show up. They're great. They're fun. We let them know that you were still a beginner, and they absolutely made sure to take care of you and keep an eye on you no and doubt. help yeah. out with us with the gear when necessary. And it's always nice when things like that can come together. Oh, I was shocked how readily I trusted everyone that was there. Yeah, because you're trusting them with your life. You're trusting that no they doubt. know what they're doing, rigging yeah. that rope, and then you heading yeah. down it expecting that nothing bad will happen. Yeah, and that that was a that was a surprise to me that I did I never questioned that. I never wondered I mean, I did of course I asked myself like who are these people? But once I saw them start to rig the lines, I it it just it, the thought disappeared. I was just like, all right, this is what we're doing. I don't know if that's cuz you trusted them or 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 just because they seemed like nice people and and seemed competent or what it was, but even from the very first thing, you know, when they, if they had said, you can jump here. I mean, when they said, you can jump here, I was like, all right, I'll jump. You know, I never was like, well, are you sure that I'm um, so-and-so? <laughs> it's like, no, this is what they say is good. And I think one of the things that helped was when you told me that Luca was like the regional expert and that he had submitted a lot of the first Which routes. Which is hilarious because he doesn't live here. He lives in San Diego, <laughs> yeah. but he spends more time here than people who do live here. Yeah. That is that is kind of crazy, but um, yeah, and everybody was nice. Nobody was condescending. They didn't kind of give me the chest thumping kind of. Right. You it know. didn't feel like when you played basketball with the kids in PE in eighth grade, right? Yeah. It just make you feel bad about yourself if you if you well, can't play as well as them. Well, that didn't happen to me. Oh, but. so you were that kid. <laughs> you were the guy picking on me. That's what that was. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I let I let the talent do the walking, but they were just super nice. And then on day two, which you know was a little more challenging. And I was definitely more tired and, and was more kind of at my at the edge of my comfort zone. They were very supportive and, again, giving me tips and you know, making never rushing me, never making me feel like they were having to wait on me. Although I was looking at the back through the video. So day one, I caught Luca yawning. like between the, <laughs> between the two of our cameras, we caught him yawning like five times. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Well, he had, on day one, he had just flown in to the airport and then drove straight to the trail. Yeah, to meet us, that's so. impressive. <laughs> and today he ran a canyon with me this morning and then had to leave to head to the airport right after that. So yeah, he's a bit of a He's beast. committed. He is a beast. Yeah. He never appeared tired even once. But one of the things I, that you mentioned, or some, I think Jesse mentioned it actually, that when you're new to something, you're so, you're far less efficient. And so I spent so much energy on things that right. you know don't require energy but right. I was I was investing a lot of kind of mental and physical energy that was wasted but that only comes with experience 
So I think if I were to go again, even now, even had only gone two days in a row, I think my approach would be completely different. My comfort level would be completely different. And even my skill set would be slightly different. We also, on day two, threw you into a little bit of an advanced canyon. So you'd probably, if you went into other popular canyons, you might have a little easier experience now after having done that. Yeah, I have. I mean, I get the sense that it would take a lot more to intimidate me now than, I mean, I, I know that there are way more advanced ones than the ones we, the second one we did, but I still think that that would give me, it gets a big confidence booster. Right, because you saw that, you did it, and then you, you've walked away from it knowing that you're capable of it. Right. So let's move on to your projects. Are there any film projects you're working on right now that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I I mentioned to you the other day that I, I don't really know where the next piece of work is coming from, but I am constantly putting myself out there and trying to cultivate things. One thing that I just finished is was a project I did for a group in town called Skate Like a Girl, which is a nonprofit that promotes empowerment of young women through skateboarding, which when I first heard about it, I was kind of like, okay, like I didn't really get it, you know. It's like, all right, cool, they have like clinics to like help girls skateboard. But then I went and met with them and interviewed them and watched them, and it's it's a really powerful experience and gives you an insight into what a young female goes through as they look at the world not only from an adventure standpoint or skill set standpoint, but also a socio-cultural standpoint. So skateboarding has traditionally been a male-dominated sport, and there's a real, at times, negative culture associated with that, where if girls try to skate, the guys think that they're there just to pick up a guy, just to be a cute girl, right? Um, or that they're a lesbian. Those are the two options you have as a girl if you want to get into skateboarding. I think that happens in a lot of sports. It probably does. Women, yeah. yeah, it probably does. But I think, you know, probably less likely Like if you were thinking about surfing. It's like, yeah, maybe they're there just to look cute. But probably they're not going to be considered a lesbian. And I think it has to do with the clothing and, and things like that. So just there's a lot of interesting social concepts happening there that I, I was not aware of. And then when you see these girls learn a move and the way their face lights up, it's just incredible to know that they are doing things they never thought possible in in a very simple construct so anyway i did that it was like a five minute video is uh, that available can people see it they can it's uh if you go to skate like a girl pdx we haven't done like the official release party yet mm -hmm. so i think they're waiting until we do re the release party to put it on the website which it's possible by the time this interview goes live that may have already happened that's true yeah so skate like a girl pdx.com and, and that is going to be their new promotional video. So that was a really big thing for me because I did it from start to finish. And it was the first time I'd ever really taken something on like that where I, was, I wasn't just second camera or assistant director or whatever. I was, I was running the whole show. And I learned a ton, obviously. You know that, how this works. Now that it's done and dusted, definitely a good confidence booster. I look at it now and I, I of course, pick out all the flaws and think right, about it. Right, which a lot of other people look at it and look right past that and look right. at the qualities of it, I'm right. sure. Yeah. yeah. So just finished that and then we were gone for a while and coming back, I've got a project related to, there's a certain part of Portland called Southwest Waterfront and I'm doing a promotional piece for their website that will be like a 60 second montage so there'll, there'll be no interviews or anything like that basically trying to get people in portland but also out of state who who may be considering like i want to move to the area where should i move people do not know about the south waterfront even though it's a stone's throw from downtown because it got built up as a new urban residential area right before the real estate bubble burst and then it just was like a ghost town all these things that were residential that were like million dollar penthouse suites all of a sudden became rental units and it was just a bad bad scenario but over the past three years, it's really rebounded. There's a lot of new commercial activity down there. Some of the hottest restaurants are down there now. A buddy of mine who's an agent down there wanted to do something to let people know, hey, we're still alive, and you should come check us out. So I'm working on that. I'm, that's scheduled to be done in by November 1st because that's when daylight savings happens, and he wants to have it. He wants to put it on his, his storefront as like a projection to run at night on a loop. And then I just I signed... I say I signed. I haven't got the contract back in the mail, but I've got another guy here locally, a 22-year-old kid who was hit by a truck while riding his bike about two months ago, severed his leg off just above the knee in the accident. I mean, it just like literally shaved his leg off. And this guy was kind of a semi-pro cyclist, 
but has no money, no works in a bike shop. He's 22 years old. And the community, the cycling community, really rallied around him. And now he wants to, he's going to get a prosthetic. He wants to become a para-Olympian. So I had reached out to him and kind of negotiated with him, you know, hey, let's tell your story. So that's on my agenda, though he's been pretty cagey. So it's kind of been hard to track him down. But if he cooperates... He's probably dealing with a lot of psychological issues oh, right man. now, too. After I mean, that, it's, I it's been really tough. I met with him, and I, I told him, I said, listen, I know that you have so much going on right now, and I don't want to be a nuisance to you, I, but I have a feeling that... He said, I want to document this. Right. And so I just was honest with him. I said, listen, this is going to take a lot of time, a lot of energy. I'm going to be in your space. I'm going to be asking you hard questions. So... If you're not, if you don't want to do it, if you don't think you can do it, just say no. He said yes, but we have yet to really put pen to paper as far as you know getting any footage or anything like that. So that's going. I've got a buddy of mine who works for a consulting firm that's cultivating a new creative arm within that consultancy, where it's video based. We've done one project together, and he is actively seeking other clients for whom we could do work. So that's something that would. It wouldn't be outdoor adventure type stuff, but it would really give me a chance to bust my chops, you know, in a directorial, you know, director of photography standpoint, also from a full production standpoint, planning and production, that kind of thing. Is your interest primarily outdoor filmmaking or are you interested in kind of more general documentary type storytelling? I like the storytelling component. Like I'm, I've, I've become more and more a believer in putting the person first, putting what I've learned is the heart of your story first and allowing that to bring people in and then use the accessories, whether it be the outdoor world or a compelling, you know, story to, to deliver a message. So I don't feel like I have to be in the outdoors to tell a good story. In fact, I kind of feel like I'd like to learn to tell a good story without using the eye candy of of majestic mountains and things like that. And then you bring that in as an added element. It's like, wow, this is really nice. So that's kind of where I see myself going is documentary style storytelling that moves people. Like I've always told myself, like every time I went to Banff Film Festival, I would walk out of there just so freaking pumped up and so moved. And I've always told myself if I could do that once, you know, if I could have a, a movie or a short or a piece that moves people that le- has them walk away motivated or uh, feeling like they can do something that they hadn't before that's what I want like that's as a storyteller or a filmmaker that's where I just like ah that's that's the guts of it for me there's an annual climbing film festival called Real Rock and I remember one time I went to it I got so pumped that I just wanted to climb there was nothing to climb, yeah. so I just climbed a tree yeah. that was <laughs> next to my car. I think that's great, though. That's a great example of the power of film, right? The power of storytelling. And, and for me, film and photography are very similar in that regard. It's In my mind, it's much more difficult to tell a story with one photograph. But you can, and you can motivate people to do things. Some people would consider it maybe frivolous or maybe completely just artistic and creative, but... If you look at some of the most powerful initiatives in our world, they they have a visual component to them that, that gets people off the couch, that gets people to donate money, that gets people to do something positive that day. Like, as a physician, I, I have spent a lot of time working with humanity. So I feel like there's a parallel there in some ways that, to be to be honest, I'll, I'll be walking away from medicine completely if I can, but I'll still have the ability to to change people and probably more people than I can as a physician because if a thousand people sit down to watch a film that's a lot more people than I can see in even a year (laughs) so that's saying a lot so I think a good way for us to wrap this up now is let us know where people can go if they want to see your work if they want to see what you're up to see what you've been doing where should they go for that website tommydaycreative.com has a link to my Instagram account which is probably the most relevant day-to-day record of where I'm going and what I'm doing. It has links to my Vimeo, which right now I'm kind of keeping most of my video stuff to myself because I I only want to produce the best stuff, but there will be examples of my video work on the Vimeo and then 
Uh, of course, the photos will be there available for purchase. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like if they go to TommyDayCreative.com, they can find you it's wherever. It's all right there, yeah. All my contacts there, everything. So Facebook, all that. All right, so people, go to TommyDayCreative.com and see what he's up to. Thanks very much. All right, thanks for doing this, man. And no thanks worries. for letting me sleep on your couch. <laughs> Anytime. Thank your wife for washing my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I thank her every day. Let's all give it up for Tommy Day. Mr. Dr. Tommy Day updates. Starting now. His South Waterfront project is complete. It's done. Well received by the client. The amputee project he discussed was unfortunately canceled. He has attended since then a Banff photo workshop where he got to train with National Geographic's Gordon Wiltsey. And it has led to a future video project with another outdoor photographer, John Price. So, good on you, Mr. Dr. Tommy Day. And if that is not enough, he will be on his way to the Himalayas in the near future to shoot photos of snow leopards. So I'd say that's a pretty good turn of events for Mr. Dr. Tommy Day. And this is a part of the show where I send you to the show notes, gogetoutside.com slash podcast, episode 22, Tommy Day. There you will find innumerable photos, a link to... Tommy Day Creative, his website, his Instagram page, which I recommend following, his Vimeo page, and a link to the Skate Like a Girl video he discussed and the website for that foundation. And I've also included an additional video there, a Scuba Climbers teaser video in there that includes footage shot by me and Tommy Day. So check that out. And I want to send a shout out to all those canyoneers up in Oregon and Washington who met up with me and Tommy Day and came along with us to shoot video in three separate canyons up in the area. So you're on the website now, right? You're checking out those links. You're checking out those photos of Tommy Day. And you're thinking, man, Tommy Day's super cool dude. I really would like to write the show. Let them know how much I enjoyed this interview with Dr. Tommy Day. Good news, my friend. It's really easy to do that. Open your email client, whatever you use to email. Type in go at butcherbirdstudios.com. That's how you get in touch with us by email. But maybe you don't like email. Maybe you want to pick up your phone and you think, I don't like typing that much. I just have so much to say. I, I want to get it out with my words. I want my passion to be felt in my delivery. Well, good news there, too. You can call 818-925-0106. That'll get you to our Google voicemail. You can leave us a three-minute message. If you have so much ebullient praise for this podcast or Tommy Day or previous guest on the show, well, you could call back. You could leave another three-minute message. You could call 20 times if you want and leave 60 minutes worth of messages. And I guarantee you, I will listen to them. And now is the part of the show where I ask you to do me a small favor, if you don't mind. Head to iTunes, Stitcher, whatever platform you use to consume this auditory goodness. Subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, if you're already subscribed, good on you. Rate, review the show. I will appreciate it greatly, and it will help me out way more than you think it will. So here we are at the end of episode 22 and the end of season one. But do not worry, the show is not going away, but we will be taking a one-month break. Come back on February 15th for the first episode of Season 2. It will be very similar to the first episode of Season 1 in that it will not be a complete episode. It will be a welcome to Season 2. There are going to be some changes, don't worry. We're still going to have interviews with awesome people, but we're also going to experiment with some other show types. Just last night, I was recording what will be the first roundtable discussion episode of the podcast. But, I am still looking for new guests, new topics. If you'd like to be on the show, if you'd like to recommend someone as a guest on the show, let us know. Send us an email, go at butcherbirdstudios.com. Or call that Google voicemail, 818-925-0106. So in that one month break, do me a favor, please. Share the show with somebody. Send it to someone who doesn't know about it, who you think might enjoy it. And if you're not caught up, go back. Catch up on those episodes you missed. Or maybe revisit the ones you really liked. Come back February 15th for a short episode introducing Season 2 and a review of some of the exciting moments from Season 1. Thanks to everyone who's listened to this show, even just for a few minutes. Especially a big thanks to all of you who are subscribed. 
Even bigger thanks to those of you who have reviewed or rated the show. This is the first time on the show you will not hear me say, next week on the show, because there's not going to be anybody next week on the show. So next month on the show, welcome to season two. See you then. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo!